Yeah. Oh boy. So, you know, he's he's not that big as far as snappers go, but he's maybe 50 pounds. Out there and yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, this is mostly about you. You know. All right, all right. You, you know more about turtle conservation than I do. Yeah, let me let me show you around, you know, show you the, the ranch as it were. Sure, uh, sure. I'm Simon Beatty. Uh, I'm an instructor at Jefferson College, professor of zoology. Uh, my background is in zoology uh, and particular turtles. Um, so I've been involved with, with wildlife uh, really my whole life and, and turtles especially. Um, and I'm, I'm very passionate about turtle conservation. Uh, and I, I work with uh, several organizations like the Turtle Survival Alliance um, to do captive breeding and, and management of, of captive populations and research of wild populations to ensure that uh, we have zero turtle extinctions and that we can provide assurance colonies for for different species uh, in the wild and have breeding and captivity as well so that's my background but I'm all about animals and especially turtles so, oh you know what I haven't seen a North American wood turtle yeah so we've got you know just your, your typical eastern box turtle here mm -hmm. you find east of Mississippi and this is this is Juanita and she's been with me for 25 years hey Juanita and she's laid uh, quite a few clutches of eggs in, over the years, so she's and she's participated in some Viable? reproduction. Oh yeah, hmm? yeah. So, so this so. is a turtle that one I've never seen in the wild, and two is just foreign to me. Yeah. So these guys, you know, they're they're more of a a, a northeastern U.S. southern Canada species that you know they're they're really tolerant of cold temperatures, and you can see that bright orange coloration mm -hmm. on the legs. Um, but this is a species that has really suffered from habitat fragmentation. Um, you know, they, they range across old growth forests and marshlands and they have seasonal habitats. Uh -huh. So during warm weather, they'll be more terrestrial. And then as it gets cooler, uh, they switch to more aquatic habitat. And so they're frequently going back and forth across different habitat areas. And when they encounter roads, you know, they often get hit. And so they've really suffered from that. So they must be fairly omnivorous? They, they are omnivorous. These guys do love uh, earthworms, but they'll take uh, uh, all sorts of fruit. You know, like the, the box turtles in particular love mushrooms and that kind of thing, but pretty much any kind of uh, invertebrate that they can catch. Do they ever eat carrion? Occasionally, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mice and things like that if I offer it. Um, they, they also, they, they, I have noticed them, uh, especially this year, they'll eat the dandelion leaves. Oh, okay. So they've been going after that displays that that sculpturing and that's where they got the name wood turtle gotcha. from that that sculptured appearance of the shell there sure she's pretty good size and she's she's normally very chill very personable and you know these, these are this is a, a species that's really been over collected from the wild for the pet trade and things like that just because they are so attractive and and you know lots of people uh, wanted to keep these as pets in the 60s and 70s still do today but most of the ones that you see today are, are like like oak here and, and the others bred in captivity. I see. So these are, are all captive bred animals. Yeah. Um, does does the male have long toenails on the front? Yeah, let me show you the male here. And so for our viewers, Cole, what we're looking at, see how far in that is concaved? Can you see that on the camera? Yeah. So that part right there matches up well with the outer part of her shell, so he can get his, do they have hip penis or just a penis? Or uh, what just, do they have? So, so turtles do have a penis, yeah. yeah. The, the tail is much longer on the male as well. If I was but, just to look at them, I would say that his head is more masculine than hers. So She that, looks a little more feminine. Well, and that, that's, a good, that's a good observation because in the male turtles, you often see a broader head. Uh -huh. And you can see, if she sticks her head out a little bit more, you can see on, on red here, that musculature. So you see mm -hmm. those big muscles right there mm -hmm. just behind the eyes. Mm -hmm. So those are really developed in the males. Um, and different species have different sort of characteristics like that. Sure. But another uh, characteristic you see in across species in a lot of male turtles, you kind of see how the back of his shell flares. That's indicative of males in a number of species gotcha. where that, that, sh that shell tends to be a little flared out. Let's go back to the fragmented habitat thing, because I don't think a lot of people really understand how bad that is. Right. And, and how bad it is, especially for turtles, you know? Right, and, and even species that may have a more restricted range, you know, take an area like this, where we've got woods on this side and we've got road over here. When you, you know, split that habitat up with roads, you're basically creating a bunch of tiny little populations that can no longer interbreed or communicate. Lessens the genetic diversity of the entire population, and each little population then becomes a relic, right. and they become less and less 
effective and less and less viable over and, time. And less able to adapt to change. Right. You know? Yeah. It's like a lot of a lot of people don't understand that the larger your habitat is, then animals have the ability to move to different sections of the habitat as change happens. Exactly. And when that habitat becomes fragmented, housing developments, industrial areas, all these different areas, then these small fragments of land are just not big enough to support when something climate changes or whatever happens. So when I was growing up as a little kid, we were always real keen if we found an alligator snapping turtle. Yeah. Because, I mean, common snapping turtles were everywhere, but when you'd find an alligator, yeah, and, that, and that's how you know that shell is very, very distinctive. Yeah, you can see the, the prominent keels, and mm -hmm. you know, everybody around here in Missouri thinks whenever they see a common snapping turtle, they immediately say it's an alligator snapping right, turtle. They do. You know, but these guys have those really big keels and that extra set of scoots right there, the super marginals, yep. which this guy's pretty calm. He's, he's pretty used to, to being handled, so he's not really gaping or anything like that. Some of the other ones are, are uh, here are pretty pretty fierce. But. So I, uh, I did a lot of work in Alexandria, Louisiana at the zoo there, mostly for the uh, wedge-tailed eagles, but they have an alligator snapping turtle that goes in at 210 pounds. Really? So he's huge. Yeah. Like he's the size around that fence almost. And they've got him underneath a six inch glass so you can see half the pond, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. And, uh, and he's, he's always keen to be up against the glass. They started becoming the, the turtle to harvest after the Endangered Species Act passed in 1973, which banned the use of sea turtles in Campbell's soup. Mm -hmm. So then Campbell's turned to alligator snapping turtles because they were, you know, big turtles. Sizable, yeah. Yeah. Um, but then they, they basically fished them out because what we, what we know now about these guys is the generation time is about 50 years. So they're so slow to reproduce. This juvenile hatched out in 2019 and it's really big for that age so this has grown really fast but they typically take about 20 years to reach maturity and then you know their life history strategy is just to survive mm. and reproduce year after year for a hundred years mm -hmm. so then when you take the adults out there's no right juveniles to take their place it takes so long for something to come to breeding age yeah and they have such a high juvenile mortality right that you know, most of them don't so, make it. So I'm a master falconer and we're really into birds of prey on our YouTube channel. And the mortality rate for birds of prey is like 65%, I mean 85%. Yeah. Like 85% of all the eggs that are laid this year are not gonna make it. And these yeah. guys are like sea turtles. Everything eats baby turtles. Exactly, yeah. You know? The adults, as you said, can get 200 pounds, but when they're, they're hatched, they're about the size of a quarter. Mm. You know, they're, they're tiny. Um, and so it's a very, low probability that any will actually survive. You feel like you're home? Yeah. It's one of those really interesting things that was ingrained to me when I was a little kid, like seven, eight, nine years old. We would all go out catching stuff because that's what we did in the swamps. And yeah, oh yeah, I see he's gaping. Yeah. yeah. And if you could catch an alligator snapping turtle, like that was the pinnacle of Yikes. catching stuff. And then we would all argue over if you actually had an alligator snapping turtle in your hands or not. Because if you had, you know, five kids and we all had snapping turtles, everybody was saying they had an alligator snapping turtles. But the one kid that did have one, it was clear, like it was crystal clear compared to the, to the common snapping turtles that have just a smooth shell. Because these guys come out all pokey and ridgy like that. Pretty yeah. good from, from, from when they're hatched. Yeah, and you can see on the, the, the juveniles show it really well, how that shell develops, mm -hmm. and it's, it's actually not as hard as you might think. It's actually got kind of a spongy layer of skin on it. And, and you know, as they get older, that fully calcifies mm -hmm. and fully ossifies. So like the, the older adults, they still have the keels, but they lose sort of that sculpturing. Yeah. And you can see like kind of the, just the spongy texture there. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna tell you, Cole, one reason why you don't want to get bit by an alligator snapping turtle is that incredibly hooked bill that comes over the top of that bottom yeah, bill. Yeah, I'm noticing that. Like, that, not only is that sharp, but there is so much power in those jaws. Mm -hmm. When I was growing up, catfishing, if your trot line got hung up, you did not reach down in there to undo your trot line because you would come up without a finger or half a hand. 
and the, and the old fellers that used to go what y everybody calls noodling now, you know, we just called it catfishing, going down and putting your hand in the crevices and underneath boat docks to catch catfish. I would hate to put my hand in something like that because you're not coming back with a hand. Yeah. Especially a big one, even one that only weighs 100 pounds. Right. You know? Yeah. But yeah, he is a little spicy. Yeah, he's a little, he's got a little bit of attitude. That one's, that one's pretty chill. So this is an adult. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this is a turtle that's protected in every state that it occurs, uh, except for South Carolina. You know, these guys suffer the same kind of, uh, consequences as wood turtles they've lost a lot of habitat they like really shallow water you know swampy habitat uh, marshes things like that when i was growing up i was born in 65 so 72 73 is the first time i can remember going to pet stores and these were super popular because they were like that big around mm -hmm. yeah know, with spots already yeah and like you could buy them for a quarter you know or yeah 50 cents yeah. i just remember they were like super cheap yeah. I don't know if they were probably all wild caught or at least eggs dug up and hatched. Yeah, maybe. probably. Yeah. I mean, these, this species is, is bred pretty regularly in captivity now. Um, and, and these specimens here, there's four adults in here. They're all captive bred. Really Just, good looking animal. Yeah, they're really pretty. They're really cute. And, and uh, uh, this one, her, her name's Honey Bunny, but she's, she's pretty, uh, pretty friendly. But uh, yeah, they've just lost so much habitat that reintroduction plans don't really work very well just because there's not really a lot of places left to, to put these guys. You get about 20 hatchlings from this, this group a year. Nice. And uh, there's a few juveniles over in some other tubs over there. So uh, is, is, this is not a Missouri native species? Not a Missouri those. native. It is native to Illinois. Central American wood turtles in here, um, and these are all basically rescue animals so there's there's four of them in here but it's it's another really neat species you know and this is uh an adult he's pretty you know they're pretty small species right but there's there's several central american south american wood turtles in this genus rhinoclemmies some get bigger some smaller and some are really rare but these guys are more of the more widespread species you know it's 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 kind of the, the same trend you see with a lot of species where they're plentiful in the wild they start getting imported for the pet trade. Most of those end up dying, and then all of a sudden the animal's rare mm. because the wild stocks have been depleted. Right. There, there is certainly a you know a demand for for turtles in in the reptile trade, but as with anything, when you can breed it in captivity, that's always the best right. way to go. But there's two Florida soft shells in here. Yeah, I see the other ones over here. Yeah. There we go, buddy. This is a fairly common species, but they're they're really cool nonetheless. And you know, soft shells are, are kind of unique among turtles. One for for having you know the the non segmented shell, and it's just that leathery covering. There's still bone underneath there. Right. You know, they're actually really fast and really agile on land, in addition to being great swimmers. Mm -hmm. um, but these are both juvenile Florida soft shells, um, and you can see that snorkel nose they've got there. So they're a whole separate family within turtles. So this is family Trionicidae. You but you're about, right about them being fast. You talk about the differences in the shells again? Yeah, so, so all turtles, you know, the shell is living tissue. It's, it's bone covered by skin. And so on the soft shell, it's the same, same principle, but that skin is not segmented into scoots like it is in the other species. So they have a bony sheath underneath here so right here you can feel bone and then that covering is just leathery skin so it's much more flexible but offers less protection and then if we flip him over you can actually see those bones oh, wow. underneath there so you can see the, the the bones there and then that's cartilaginous tissue here covered by skin so it's not a complete covering so they're a little bit more exposed but that does give them a little bit more flexibility. He's a little shy, but he is used to people because if this was a wild specimen, this would be a lot harder to the handle. The neck extends the length of the shell? Yeah, the neck is as long as the shell is. Whoa. So if you pick up a wild specimen, especially a larger one, <laughs> they can tag you anywhere. Most dangerous turtle you can encounter if you're actually turtle trapping and doing surveys uh, and, and, you know, 
looking at population numbers is a big soft shell. Snapper, you can handle. A big soft shell is, is almost impossible to wrangle, especially if you're in a boat and it's in a hoop net, it's not fun. Yeah, my own personal experience with these guys is that I always grab them back here, the yeah. big ones. I grab them back here by the, lo the leg. Yeah. And if, if their head comes over the top like this, their nose is gonna hit you first. But if their head comes from the side, you're bleeding. Yeah, yeah. And you know, you can see on that head, they, they've got kind of what looks like lips, but they do have a very strong beak underneath that. Uh, and so they can deliver a pretty nasty bite. It's sharp too. Yeah. You know, I, I've been very fortunate. I've only been bitten severely one time, and that was when I was about 14, 15 years old. And it was by a spiny soft shell turtle, and it was on a trot line. And, you know, we were trying to get the hook out, and you just blink for a second, bam. Yeah. You know, and it caught me right there. And it was like, I mean, it just sliced both sides like in a perfect, looked like one of those old timey can openers, mm -hmm. you know? It was like a perfect little triangle right there. And man, you want to talk about bleeding. I mean, I bled. Yeah. Oh boy. So, you know, he's, he's not that big as far as snappers go, but he's maybe 50 pounds. Um, he's got a big old head. Yeah, but you can see he's he's actually got a lot of pollen on him from all the trees. Yeah, he got some algae growth on him. He's actually uh, he's he's 22 years old, so he was hatched in. Oh, he's just a baby still. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, he's like well, he'd be like teenager maybe. Yeah, he's just at that at that cusp of maturity. You know, this specimen might actually be a female. It's kind of hard to tell on these guys, but. So is it 50 I, pounds right now? I would, go about? I would go female. Yeah. Because I've been that I've seen quite a few of them. Like you said, though, it's hard to tell yet. Yeah. We'll probably, we'll probably know in a couple of years. Right. <laughs> and he's, uh, you know, fairly used to being handled, but still does that, that gape pretty, uh, pretty actively. Yeah. So you can see a couple things going on uh, in the mouth there. So one is the lure up front. And on, on this animal, it's, the lure is actually a little bit easier to see in the juveniles, because in, in this guy, he doesn't have it uh, engorged with blood, so it kind of, looks kind of gray on the bottom of the mouth there. So it's the part that looks like a worm. The, yeah, that's the part that looks like the worm. And then behind that, that kind of pink triangle, that's their epiglottis. So you see the opening to the throat there, and then they can, what, what these guys often do, underwater if you mess with them is they'll blow bubbles through that and uh, kind of shoot air at you but but that's what that is so that's just a little valve alligator snapping turtles come from uh, a farm here in missouri loggerhead acres turtle farm um, and that's where this guy and, and the juveniles came from yeah there you go we'll give our turtle a bath on national turtle day that's right that's right you always got to keep your snapper clean <laughs> you know you can kind of see what we we're talking about earlier as they get older, you know, this is still a young adult. Yeah. It's still got a lot of that sculpturing, but that shell's starting to harden and really ossify. Fully aquatic. They don't bask. They, they really only ever come on land to lay eggs. They have to have that, that good nesting habitat to do that. But And so you think flood control efforts and straightening out places and not having... Yeah, channelization of rivers and, and getting rid of sandbars and things like that, that's had a huge effect on a lot of different species. And, and that, that's been really detrimental for, for a number of different uh, turtles and other wildlife. So would you be able to recap this turtle real quick, just because I missed it for our main vlog? Yeah, so, so this animal uh, is uh, an alligator snapping turtle that's been in captivity since 1960. So this is one of the longest known uh, captive animals. Um, it, it's pretty small for that age. Uh, for a long time, it was held in uh, a university where it was it was purposely kept small. It's actually grown quite a bit uh, since I've had it, and I've had this animal for uh, 19 years now. And, wow! I mean, are they kept small just by size of enclosure, or is uh, no? So, so this animal was was withheld food oh, and God. just fed very sparingly to keep it small. You know, it, as long as you feed them properly, it doesn't matter what size enclosure you have; they're gonna they're gonna grow. Okay. Didn't know if it was a fish situation. No, not quite. Well, you can actually see this 
area here oh, of the shell, how it's a slightly different color. Much larger. So this area of the scoot, they grow almost like trees and you can sometimes gauge their growth almost like tree rings. This area here was its original scoot when I got it. And so in 20 years, it's put on about that much, which for a turtle this old is a lot. Yeah. Um, because, you know, they usually stop, stop growing significantly after a while. They, they continue to grow throughout their lifetime just very slowly. Yeah, you can see the other turtles' rings are pretty similar in size, and it looks like more of like a standard growth where this one almost yeah. has this line around it where you can see that extra growth. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you can, you can especially see that, that darker line here. And, you know, this animal, uh, I, when I got it in 2003, uh, it was a much thinner animal. Um, so meaning it's it's gotten a lot deeper in size. You know, it still displays that that the age that you see in an alligator snapper comes in the rounding of the shell and the smoothing of those ridge lines. Mm -hmm. But they'll always retain those three keels. So, you know, everybody everybody thinks they see an alligator snapping turtle sure. on the road, but it's it's usually a common snapper. Right. Well, we want to put this guy back in. Sure. Swim. Swim free. Oh look, yep. Little baby oh. spotted turtle. Isn't that cute? That is the sweetest. So when they when they first hatch out, they are so tiny, like less than your the thumbprint yeah, of your yeah. palm. Yeah, almost wow. almost the size of a dime. Yeah. So that that one's actually grown quite a bit since it, it hatched out. And how old is this one? Um, not quite a year. So this has been a great National Turtle Day, Simon. I appreciate you. Are there any conservation groups or any groups that we should be involved with or have links to on our YouTube channel? Yeah, you know, if, if anybody's interested in turtle conservation, um, you can go to, to places like the Turtle Survival Alliance, tsa.org, um, and they're, they're one of the leading uh, groups of, of turtle conservationists. Uh, they do research and, and breeding work all around the world. Um, and there, there are other groups that are focused on, on captive husbandry, like the Turtle and Tortoise Preservation Group, the TTPG. Um, so those are all things that, that people can, can seek out online um, and, and you know, find more information about it. And uh, you know, if you want to get involved with it, um, with turtle conservation, you, know, you can always donate or, or just help a turtle across the road. I'm always telling people that, look, if you're going to stop and help a turtle across the road, help it all the way across. Yeah. So what's the truth or the falseness of that? Well, you know, when turtles are crossing the road, they usually have a pretty good idea where they're going. Mm -hmm. um, and so you want to help it in the direction where it was headed, because typically if they're crossing a road, they're going either to find a new habitat or to lay eggs somewhere. And they have a very good sense of direction. Um, and if you put it back where it came from, it's just going to go across the road again. So just help it off in the direction mm -hmm. it was going if you can. One of the advantages of having Jenna on the team we, uh, we get to go to cool places and have great National Turtle Day experiences. This has been great. Does Jenna want a turtle now? Jenna wants all the turtles. No, we've got three turtles. That's three turtles enough. 